Hello. So, I had this childhood home. And you're thinking, yes, I had a childhood home. And maybe you had two or three childhood homes. Or maybe, like my wife, you had 10 or 12 childhood homes because their father was in the Air Force. But I only had one childhood home, and I'm going to talk about it today, but I'm also going to talk about growing up in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and I'm going to talk about my hometown and the middle class and gentrification. And I'm going to use my family as an example, not because it was unique, but because it was so typical. And not to give away the ending, even though it's in the title of the talk, but uh, we've sold our house recently, and I did an art project where I lived my childhood over again. So in 1945, my father was coming home from Guam after World War II, and my mother was buying a 1922 beach house in the sleepy town of Manhattan Beach, California. And there was a lot of empty lots around there at the time because living at the beach wasn't nearly as desirable as it is, as it is today. And she paid $5,400 for it. It was furnished with dishes and plates and things. And I asked her about it one time, and she said, we didn't know how we were going to make the payments. And I thought that was startling. And then my father told me that when he got home from the war, he got a job in the LA Police Department, and he was making $75 a month. So they settled in and started a family, and he rose up the ranks to detective sergeant, and he was also the policeman who took crime scene photographs. And I'm not sure if that's where he became interested in photography or not, but I know that he became a very serious amateur photographer, so much so that he built this dark room on top of our house, and this is where he did all of his photography and uh, printing and developing. That was my sister in my bedroom downstairs. That's me on the stairway there. And uh, this was like the original man cave. And so I want to stress how ridiculously average our family was. <laughs> there was my sister and me. There was my stay-at-home mom. There, the grandmother lived downstairs from us. We had a Cocker Spaniel because by law, everyone in America had to own a Cocker Spaniel. <laughs> we went on driving vacations in the station wagon. So it was, it was so amazingly typical, but the only difference that I can see between our family and so many millions of other post-war families is that my father had his camera with him at all time, and he took pictures of every event in our lives, every Christmas, every birthday, first day of school, Boy Scouts, Little League, Everything was, there was this hyperchronology of our, that's not even a word, but it's a hyperchronology of our family. And fortunately, he was sort of on the hoarder spectrum because all these photographs he took were organized and dated and cataloged and permanently preserved in our darkroom upstairs for decades. So now I'm going to talk about gentrification because gentrification is, a, is an issue here in San Antonio and it's been an issue in Southern California for decades and there it's, it's Alice in Wonderland. They don't even call it gentrification anymore, they call it ultrification. And I'll give you an example. When I graduated from high school in 1970, the average price of a house in Manhattan Beach was $30,000. Five years later it had doubled to $60,000. Five years after that, it went to $100,000, and five years after that, it doubled to $200,000. So the 15 years from 1970 to 1985 went from $30,000 to $200,000, and it wasn't stopping there. And I'll save you some time and cut to the chase. And today, 2018, the average price of a house in Manhattan Beach is $2.3 million like a house like that. <laughs> and I'll give you another example. The first row of houses at the beach is called The Strand. And our house is two blocks up from The Strand. While I was doing this project, a house sold down on The Strand, nice house, 30 by 90 foot lot, sold for $15 million. And they tore it down to build a bigger house. So. So back to reality here. My mother died in 1995 and my father died in the year 2000. 
And we brought my sister out. That's not the same dog, by the way, as the one that was <laughs> in my, when I was Daniel Boone. Uh, and anyway, we brought my sister out, and we've been renting it out to a, to a rotating group of surfers and beach types for a long time. The house was not in good shape, but we've been getting offers on it from people that wanted to buy the house. Um, and they've been usually like offers in the neighborhood of like an armored car full of money. And we, um, we weren't going to live there, and like I said, the house was falling apart. And we knew, my father knew before he died, that whoever bought the house was going to scrape it and build a McMansion there, because that's what they've been doing for the last 30 years. And so in 2015, a realtor friend of mine called me up and told us that an identical lot in Manhattan Beach had just sold for what sounded to us like Fort Knox. So we had about a five minute conversation and we made the decision to sell the house. But this was not an easy decision to make. This house had been in our family for 70 years. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot in San Antonio, but in, in the beach area, that's what passes for a legacy. But as you can see, also, my father built most of the house himself. All my childhood memories were from living at this house. My, my grandmother died in the studio apartment downstairs, and my father died in his bed. And so th this wasn't going to be easy. So I had it written in the contract of sales that... I was going to occupy the house for two months and I was going to do some sort of art project with it and I didn't quite know what that was going to be but I wanted to, I wanted to pay tribute to the house, I wanted to uh, recognize my father's photography, I wanted to honor our family history and I wanted friends and relatives to be able to come over and share our experiences of growing up there together. So my first idea was that I was going to take all of those photographs from upstairs and I was going to plaster the inside of the house with it. And then I realized that I was going to be living there and I really didn't want to share that experience with people. So then I got the idea that I could enlarge the photographs and put them on the outside of the house. <laughs> Wouldn't that look cool? So. I've been working with this giant printing company uh, that's here in San Antonio, and they have an inkjet printer that prints onto MDO board, which is a waterproof sign painter's plywood. And so I um, got together the photographs, and with the help of my wife, we went over the piles and piles, and we found the photographs that we felt told the story and told the story of the house and things. And so this is my uh, studio assistant, Zach, who's the best studio assistant in the world. And he came over and we had them printed and we loaded them up into a truck and we drove off to California. And once we got here, I wasn't quite sure of where everything was going to go, but I, it was kind of like putting together a gigantic jigsaw puzzle where uh, there was a lot of visualization about how these square photos were going to be broken up into these irregular shapes, and it really made me wish I had paid more attention in geometry class, but fortunately, Zach was a whiz at measurements, and so um, we worked on it for six days and finished off and climbed down off the ladder, and there was 112 family photos attached to the outside of the house. So my father was a very prominent member of the Manhattan Beach community. After he, after he retired from the police department, he opened up Sweeney's Hardware Store just a couple blocks away from our house. And he was, uh, started out as like a Cub Scout Packmaster and the PTA president. And then he went on to become a city councilman for 25 years. And he was the mayor three times during that tenure, and he was involved in every committee and organization, and I don't ever remember a time, oh, he was citizen of the year twice, and I don't ever remember a time when he wasn't completely involved in the city activities. And so, I just... I, he knew everybody in town, too, and, and he had all sorts of friends. Everyone loved him, and it, it was sort of a tribute to him. I just wanted his friends to come over and see this project. It was his photos, and it was his house. And so I settled into this 
big old empty house with my sad little twin mattress and I just wanted people to show up. So I, I even like organized tours on Wednesday nights and just so I would force myself to be there for one thing and then I would have people come over and hopefully take a tour of the house. So the first people to show up were from ABC Eyewitness News <laughs> and they came down and interviewed me and they put it on the news that night and I didn't see it because I didn't have a TV set but I woke up the next morning and the entire front of our street was covered with news vans and reporters and people and this one young lady came running up to us with her phone and she says, look, you're trending, you're trending. And I said to my wife, look, we're trending. And my wife says, what does that mean? I said, I don't know, but this woman's really excited about it. So it was trending. And the second thing is that Reuters News Service picked up on it and it went around the world. And by that, I mean, it was in the newspapers. It was in the newspapers in New Zealand and Sweden and the Ukraine, which I thought was great. But so my massive fan base in the Ukraine could see it. But, um, but anyway, my favorite story is that I had a friend, there's a brilliant artist in town named Jennifer Datchuk, who was over in Europe, and she developed a very severe stomach problem where she had to have emergency surgery. And she was in a hospital, and I had, of course, I was oblivious to any of this. But anyway, I got a text from her, and, and the text, um, she says... Um, she says, I'm laying here in a hospital bed in Krakow, Poland, dying. What the frig am I doing looking at Gary Sweeney on television in Polish? Am I hallucinating? <laughs> it's like, I can't believe she recognized me either. It's like I was in Duran Duran or something. But, uh, anyway, so, um, so uh, obviously this was the best send-off I could ever have hoped to give. I... I'm only exaggerating slightly when I tell you that I saw everybody from my past that I ever wanted to see. I saw people that I hadn't seen in 50 years. I saw elderly friends of my parents, old customers from the hardware store, um, former neighbors. My high school had a reunion there. I saw people from Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts in every facet of my life. My seventh grade teacher came to it. My, my English teacher from high school showed up. And those were just the people that I knew. There was, of course, scores and scores of people that I didn't know because, I, because of the great publicity that I got from it. But I met a, a bunch of people and it, it, it seemed to really strike a chord with baby boomers because they all seemed to have the same childhood experiences I had. And, and also, there was a bunch of people that I met who had the similar experience of the bittersweet decision of selling their childhood home and having them turn into condos. One sweet woman told me that she, it was the nicest thing I heard. She says, you've done what we all wish we could have done. And so I, I occupied the house for two months, the month of February. And after that was done, my wife came out a bunch to help me with everything. And uh, Zach came out and we took the photos off the wall. We loaded them into the trucks and we drove off to Texas. So the long drive home really gave me a chance to finally catch my breath and look back on this final farewell. And it struck me on how much of my life this house represented. And it also struck me how fortunate I was, not just in the family that I had and the place that I grew up, but how fortunate it was that I was even able to do such a project like this and bring in all my family and relatives and friends to relive our childhood memories. So I want to leave you with a quote. And um, it says, uh, if I can remember it, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>